It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to Wine to Five. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Because this time, right now, as this is airing, Steph is in Prague getting pretty geeky with history, art, and culture, aren't you, Steph? Wait, Val, I'm right here. Hold on your hot minute. I'm not in Prague. I'm right here. Well, that's because Steph and I are pre-recording another fun interview for you guys before I say bon voyage to Steph. Uh, Steph. (laughs) Bon voyage. (laughs) I know. Bon voyage. Tell everybody where you're going. This is so exciting. Well, I am going to be headed to Bordeaux for that marathon I've been mentioning in previous episodes. So the Marathon du Medoc for some wine tourism and a lot of running precisely like you know 26.2 miles of running and i don't know how i'm exactly going to do all that while you're supposed to be drinking and eating oysters and all of that other craziness but i will be there for about a week and then i will be in prague which is some place that justin and i have never been so we're going to go tra la la over there for all of that culture and then Lastly, we will be in Munich for a raging Oktoberfest for about five days. And all of that with some friends that will be celebrating a very cool retirement. So we will be uh, applauding them, that big achievement. And so basically, we should just sort of like save all of these cool travel stories for when I return. And let's get today's party started okay oh let's do it we're having a cheese party we're going to planet cheese Steph. tell us all about it (laughs) okay so today's interview that we are doing just for you special for you is with janet fletcher janet as you may know is the author or co-author for nearly 30 books that's like three zero guys on food and beverage, including cheese and wine, cheese and beer, fresh from the farmer's market, and down to earth, a seasonal tour of sustainable wine growing in California. Among her most recent works are two memoirs with Napa Valley legend Margaret Mondavi, Margaret Mondavi's sketchbook and Margaret Mondavi's vignettes. Janet publishes the weekly Planet Cheese blog, and is the cheese columnist for Specialty Food and the Psalm Journal magazines. She teaches cooking and cheese appreciation classes around the country. Her journalism has received three James Beard Awards and the IACP Burt Green Award. And her food writing has appeared in numerous national publications, including the New York Times, Saveur, fine cooking, and food and wine. But before we lock and load this interview, you guys, let's find out what Val's got in her glass today. Well, <clears throat> I drank a lot of it while while we were chatting with Janet. <laughs> <laughs> what, what Val was drinking in her glass yeah. today. <laughs> this is one of those bucket list whiskeys that I have been trying to get my mitts on for over a year. So come to Mama. Red Breast Sherry Finish, Loose Style Edition. What does that mean, Val? Well, this is a joint effort or a collaboration by Middleton Distillers, who also bring you that lovely Jameson and that yellow spot that I raved about earlier this year. And between Middleton Distillers and Bodegas Loose Style Sherry Producers in Spain, they have come up with this beauty. And what we have here is a single pot still whiskey that is not only aged in bourbon and sherry barrels that they use regularly for between uh, nine to 12 years, but it is then 
treated to Oloroso sherry season barrels for another year. And we also talked about this with Suzanne Redman right. from Cask Magazine and how this is one of those crossover collaboration products. But Steph, the nose on this alone is taking me to fall or autumn, which is what it will be when this episode airs. And that's your favorite time of year. It is my favorite time of year. I have been waiting since March for fall. So, <laughs> And you've been waiting how long to get your hands on that whiskey? Over a year. Yeah. I think this was released, was it last May or something? And everywhere in town, I would ask for it. Nobody had it. And I finally saw it at K&L. They had like seven bottles left, I think. So got my hands on one. Honestly, $65, $66. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be in terms of price. And it comes with this beautiful gift box with tiny, teeny, tiny writing on it that I can't even read with my glasses. So I, I can't tell you what the hell it says. It's, it's a beautiful gift. So I would definitely, if you've got a whiskey lover, this is... I feel like I'm doing a commercial for a red breast, but it is a beautiful whiskey. I'm not going to say it's my favorite because I say that every time I get a new whiskey, but this is up there. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Like I wasn't expecting this level of complexity and savory. Like I was telling you earlier, like salted caramel meets like pastry cream and custard and burnt orange peel. I don't know. It's just got a lot going on. And if you can imagine, it's, it's actually more than I imagined it would be more intense. Okay, don't drink it all before I get down to the springs. No, absolutely not. Our whiskey does hang around for quite a while. So I think uh, Eagle Rare is the only one I go through a lot of because I make cocktails with it. So okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, what do you got? Well, I'm drinking something that you've had before. And this is the non-vintage Gruet Sauvage Blanc de Blanc. And this is, of course, sparkling wine. It is in the method champenoise, and it is a zero dosage, okay? So this is as dry as it gets. And they call this wine sauvage, which is right across the, the front of the bottle. That's all the front label even says is sauvage yeah. on it. And that means wild or untamed. And actually... I kind of feel wild or untamed right now because I'm really enjoying this cheese that oh, I'm it's having. Cheese chatter. And then, <laughs> this is a cheese show, by the way. You know, at <laughs> least this episode is. But in honor of Janet, I'm having some outstanding cheese and I'm going a little bit crazy with this bubbly. It is 100% Chardonnay. So if you are one of those people who say that you don't like Chardonnay, you know, this is the wine that might change your mind, okay? Or any Blanc de Blanc for that matter. But this is also 100% making me happy. So. Nice. Isn't that good? And it's only $20. I know. I didn't know that was a Gruet product when I first saw it. And and then I flipped it over and I just, I love the label. Uh, I poured it for the school teachers when I did the taste for America, Teach for America tasting in July, and they absolutely loved it. I think that's the one we had with the, uh, I think they did a fried quail with like yeah. some kind of apricot puree over an arugula dish or whatever. So it, it was like, you know, because you always think about champagne and fried chicken. So we actually had the fried quail with that wine, and it was a beautiful pairing. Fried food and bubbles, you cannot go wrong. Yeah. Cheese and bubbles cannot go wrong. Cheese and whiskey <laughs> can't go wrong. <laughs> But uh, you know what else can't go wrong is this interview with Janet Fletcher. So you guys enjoy that. And we'll be back with you guys afterwards. So we're here with, with Janet Fletcher. And right now we have her website up because Janet is the uh, the authority on cheese and wine, cheese and beer. And you've written books on these things and fresh from the farmer's market. And thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. We should just kind of get right into it. Yes, let's get into this. How did you get into food and wine writing? And then also tell us, you know, kind of how it's changed over time, the then and the now of being a food and wine writer? Well, I came to it through food. I uh, studied at the Culinary Institute of America and thought maybe I wanted to be a chef or a caterer. And I actually cooked in restaurants for two or three years and loved that, but decided that I really had more of a writer's temperament and wanted more of a writing lifestyle than that crazy restaurant lifestyle. So I started writing. I got a big break uh, when I was very young. And uh, one job has just led to another. And I've spent my entire, apart from those two or three years initially in the uh, restaurant world, I spent my entire career as a food writer and it's been just the most fun way to make a living. Tell us more about that big break. Well, I, uh, before there was Robert Parker, who, you know, is the 
you know, the critic of all time. There was a, a right. gentleman in the Bay Area named Robert Finnegan, and he was uh, an eminent uh, wine critic nationally. Everybody took Robert Finnegan's Private Guide to Wines. And he also had a, a, a publication called Robert Finnegan's Private Guide to Restaurants, and he reviewed Bay Area uh, restaurants. Then a lot of people around here took that newsletter. And I just made a cold call uh, when I was right out of college and uh, cooking school. And I said, do you happen to need any help? And he said, well, in fact, I do. So I wow. started, uh, he had just way too much going on. And I started ghostwriting for his restaurant newsletter. So, I mean, if you can imagine, I was like 23 years old, new to San Francisco, in love with food. And I was getting to go around to all the restaurants and critique them, and somebody else was paying the bill <laughs> and paying me a little bit. And paying going, me a little bit is, aside. Yeah, of so it was. Uh, I can't remember what I was paid. It was probably next to nothing, but it was a wonderful introduction uh, to writing, and I got um, very excited about uh, writing more and wanting to have my own newsletter. So that's kind of how I transitioned uh, into from the restaurant into food writing. Okay, so I got to ask you, cheese. I mean, yeah, that came along a little bit later. <laughs> I mean, I've, 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 I've always loved cheese from the time I uh, I spent a semester in France in college in southern France. And I, my eyes were just opened because I did not grow up with good cheese at uh -huh. all. <laughs> None and, of us did, uh, I don't think. You know, I was right. uh, just fascinated by it. I would see those little hard disks of goat cheese at the farmer's market in Provence and what are those and you know just the idea that you could make a whole course out of cheese and we would go to people's homes um, and they would you know have a cheese platter and you'd go to a restaurant and they would wheel that cart up to the table and I just fell in love with the ceremony and the way it uh, the way it made a meal kind of stretch out and you got uh, more time at the table and more time with another bottle of wine so I, mm -hmm. I think I fell in love with the ritual as much as with the cheeses but it's always been part of my life. We've always had a cheese course at home instead of dessert. Uh, but a, che a cheese course might just be a piece of cheese, you know, yeah, whatever I have. Right. Um, but I, we, we do have cheese almost every night. And about oh, maybe 15 years ago, I started noticing that other people were getting into cheese. Restaurants were serving more cheese and making a little more fuss over it. And that's when I did my first uh, book. Just as a food writer, I was always looking for the next trend, and that seemed to me to be a trend. So I wrote a little book called The Cheese Course about ways you could dress up cheese at your table with a special condiment or a interesting bread or uh, preserves or what have you, a, an interesting salad. And that little book is still in print, and it uh, kind of launched my deep dive into cheese. And I um, am still at it 15 years later with a blog called Planet Cheese. And I, I just love learning something new about cheese every week. I like the name of the book, The Cheese Course. It's almost like a double entendre course about cheese. And then, of course, the cheese course, which anybody who's been to France or even a really nice restaurant has had that cheese course and right between dinner and dessert <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the way a lot of Americans tend to have cheese. No, uh, I'm, I'm certainly aware that most people didn't have cheese at the start of a meal, which is fine. But I it's not my preference, because I think cheese is uh, very filling, you know, it's yeah. high in fat. And I want it at the end of the meal when uh, I, I find that if you put cheese out at the beginning, uh, with cocktails or that first glass of wine, people just overindulge. They eat too much because they're hungry. Right. And so then it really just dulls their appetite. And I think that cheese at the end of the meal, you just want a little bit. Uh, you just have an ounce, maybe two ounces, and that's that's enough. I kind of agree with you. I put out three cheeses uh, Friday night, and sure enough, by the time the main course was served, I was already full because I love cheese so much. It was just like, and you're sampling it while you're putting it, the cheese plate together and, and all that. But yes, when you go over to Europe and they pass those three or four cheeses around at the end and you're kind of like, okay, you just take a little bit, a little nibble just to have with whatever wine's left over or whatever wine you've ordered and you, you tend to not go crazy on it. You savor it like you do when you're having a dessert, you know, because it is at the end and you only have enough room for a few little tastes. But in my France experience, my first time definitely turned me on to cheese so much so that oftentimes during those other courses, 
that came before the cheese, I would really watch what I ate and maybe only had a few bites because I was so excited for the cheese course that I would left a lot of room for that. Well, I think that's a good, a very good point. And and I've learned this gradually in my own home entertaining that if I want people to appreciate the cheese board, I need to back off a little bit on what comes before. So we don't have a huge main course uh, or huge first course. I try to keep them, you know, pretty small so that by the time we get to the cheese, people still want it. (laughs) Right. Okay. I have a question. Uh, Janet, because uh, Mm -hmm. one thing about cheese, and and I'm just, it is like my favorite food. I'm like, cheese is what's going to kill me. I don't care. I love it. It, (laughs) I will sacrifice, like I will hardly eat any meat because I'd rather save my saturated fat and cholesterol for cheese. And often I'll cut up some nice pieces of cheese and I'll just have them by themselves. And my fiance is like, well, I'm going to get the crackers. I'm like, ha, crackers. Uh, no, <laughs> I, <laughs> I just want the cheese. I don't want to fill up on crackers. So are you pro cracker or does it depend? Well, I think people should have whatever they want. With there you cheese, go. <laughs> but my, uh, if you put out crackers, I'm not going to have any. I'll tell you that. I just, uh, I'm kind of with you. I just want the cheese. I don't even usually have it with bread, but I know that uh, most people do want something. So, you know, I always have bread with cheese when I'm serving it just for my guests. I don't usually partake, right. but Right. Yeah, I just want, you know, a hard cheese, it really just doesn't need bread. If you've got a really right. soft, creamy, spreadable cheese, yeah, then I can see uh, wanting something to spread it on. But um, the cr- thing about crackers for me is that they are, I think they kind of get in the way of appreciating the texture of the cheese. And also they usually have fat in them. So right. you don't really need that extra dose of uh, fat. I just eat cheese with a knife and fork, honestly, and uh, that's it. Don't even usually get bread in there. <laughs> that's it. If you want to spread cheese on something, you take the soft cheese, you spread it on the hard cheese. So, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that's really funny. Well, earlier today, I I went to the Fox and the Crow cheese shop here in Fort Collins because you said that you had just been there, and I know a few people who work over there. And I, of course, name drop you and everybody's like, oh, my God, Janet, you better send us the link to the episode. And we're so excited for you, you know, and I picked up a few ounces of the Itty Azabel Spanish sheep's cheese. Mm -hmm. And I have it here in front of me. And it is talk about having no crackers, no bread and no utensils. It's just me and the cheese. <laughs> Very good. Your own intimate moment with cheese. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, that's you know, it's right. a hard cheese. It's a hard cheese. It's full of flavor. And when you have it all by itself, you can just appreciate everything that it has exactly. to offer. And what, yes. how great that they had that because it's not a very common cheese. You don't see it everywhere. And that's the reason you would patronize a small independent cheese shop like that because they're going to have things that the big uh, supermarkets don't have. Exactly. And they have to kind of hand sell a cheese like that because people don't know how to pronounce it. They don't know what it is. So oh, it yeah. takes a merchant who's willing to hand sell and interact with the customer to move a cheese like that. I mean, it's just like moving any kind of wine that's unusual in a lot of markets. So you'd have to really have to tell somebody a story to make them start drooling to sell that wine. It's not like most people are going to walk into a wine shop and go, oh, look, the 2012 Chateau Prudeau from uh, Bandol. Nobody's going to know what that is. Right. So it's the same with the cheese, you know, the different cheeses. I remember the first time I started kind of getting into, and that's my, I guess, artisan cheeses or just interesting cheeses before I started really hanging out in Europe a lot more. I was actually at Visa Tui in Napa because that was part of where we went on our little bus. You know, a bunch of lieutenants would load into a bus out at Beale Air Force Base and we would cruise up and down 29 and they had a cheese counter. And there was something behind the counter called Mahone I'd never had before. Uh-huh. And you can get a bottle of wine, you can get your cheese and you go out and you have your little picnic. And then I was like, okay, so what else you have? And they had to like explain these cheeses to me. And it was, it was eye opening. I mean, it just seems now looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, my Gamay Rouge and Mahone, I was good. And now it's kind of like, you know, whatever's weird we're picking up like that with the Liche de Bourguignon that I have right now that I'm just crazy about that I could eat with a fork. And, you know, these crazy cheeses that you can only get in Europe because they're made with unpasteurized milk or what have you. 
that we go crazy for, but it's, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I really encourage people if they're trying to learn more about cheese to go into a shop and order something you haven't had before, uh, maybe buy an old favorite, but then challenge yourself and buy something you don't know. Right. Uh, I always like to ask the merchants, you know, what are you taking home tonight? <laughs> What's best today? Because the cheese has really changed. Not only does the inventory change a lot, but the cheese condition changes a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cheese that might have been great last week is not so great this week. It's over the hill. Right. So, you know, or, or underripe. So it's always a good idea to ask the merchants what's tasting great today. And half the time they'll let you taste it. I have not heard that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. Definitely the tasting for sure, Val. Like, yeah, ask for a taste just like you would when you can taste something that's like a, a wine by the glass program just before you commit to the whole glass. And it's before you hit commit to the whole wedge of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, the best shops are going to offer you uh offer you that. I really think uh, the great shops, when you walk in and you're kind of looking around the selection, if somebody doesn't come up to you and say, can I offer you a taste of something? Or would you like to taste this? They haven't been very well trained. I, I really appreciate a shop uh, where the clerks do that because I know they've been trained to engage the customer and get you tasting. When they can get the cheese in your mouth, they know they can sell it. I love Definitely. that. Well, tell us more about what can people find when they go to Planet Cheese and <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> Planet Cheese when they take take the uh, shuttle to Planet Cheese and uh, <laughs> and also go on the world, one of your world cheese tours. Let, let's talk about those things. Well, Planet Cheese is a weekly e news newsletter slash blog. Uh, people can sign up uh, at um, planetcheese.org or my website, which is janetfletcher.com. You can sign up to get it in your inbox every week. And it's just a way to learn something new every week. It's in small doses. Uh, I write about new cheeses, new cheese shops, where to buy cheese in Paris, uh, you know, uh, cheese issues like uh, issues around raw milk or cheese politics. Uh, you know, cheese tourism, uh, just uh, new books about cheese, whatever, and recipes too that uh, incorporate cheese or showcase cheese. So it's just a little something new about cheese every week. And the World Cheese Tour is a series that I've been doing in Napa, where I live, for five or six years now. And it's a uh, monthly Cheese classes, they're always based around a theme. Um, next, in a couple of weeks, we're, we're going to be tasting uh, winners, blue ribbon winners from the American Cheese Society competition, which happened last month. So mm -hmm. my students will have the chance to taste seven cheeses that were deemed uh, best in their category. And then in October, uh, which is the last class in this year's series, we'll be tasting new and notable cheeses from, from Europe, from Switzerland, Italy, France, Spain, whatever, you know, the best that I can find that, that didn't exist uh, 10 or 15 years ago. How do these cheeses come on your radar? Well, I, you know, I'm just focused on them. So every time I pass a cheese shop, I'm not going to pass a cheese shop. I'm going to go <laughs> and, and uh, well, just last week I was in San Luis Obispo for some book work and I was sitting in a cafe and I glanced out the window and across the street, there's a shop called Fromagerie Sophie. Mm. And I thought, I've heard of that. And uh, so as soon as I finished my coffee, I walked across the street and Fromagerie Sophie is uh, fairly new, but it's an absolutely charming independent cheese shop with an amazing selection, mostly imports, but really beautiful selection of cheese. And, you know, and if you're in a small town, so I'm always looking for, you know, what's new. And there's always something new. People keep saying to me, when are you going to run out of cheeses? And it's, it's, <laughs> I am very happy to say it's not going to happen because they just keep coming. Not only do American producers keep creating new things, but and they're keeping new American producers, but we get more and more uh, cheeses coming in from Europe and from places that we never got cheese from before. We're starting to get cheese from uh, Austria, from Germany, from oh, what was the latest? I think it was a cheese from Denmark that I saw uh, at the food show recently or Norway. I can't remember. A lot of, you know, cool stuff from England. It's it's just really blown open in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. 
Wow. Just signed up for your newsletter while we were just... Thank you. (laughs) It's easy. It's painless. And you can always unsubscribe if you grow bored with it. But I hope you won't. No, I'm I'm sure we won't. But uh, as far as recipe development and pairings, how did you get involved with that? Well, you know, I I did go to cooking school and uh, had that restaurant experience and as a transition to food writing. And part of that is, is right for me has been writing cookbooks. I'm on my 30th cookbook. And so that means uh, developing recipes. I also do a lot of collaborations. I work with chefs to get their books into print or uh, organizations and done a couple of books with Wine Institute that are more wine focused, but have recipes. And so you're just uh, looking around for new ideas, fresh ideas, and sometimes just reinterpreting classics um, with a slight twist. Um, But, you know, food changes over time. When I look back at some of the things I did 30 years ago, some of them, some of them are still, you know, still appeal to me or still relevant to me. And some of them seem a little dated, uh, but, uh, that's part of the fun. There's always new ideas, fresh thinking in um, in food. So I try to stay on top of it, and uh, it keeps my recipes uh, fresh and contemporary. I hope. What's the latest book that you worked on? Well, the one I'm working on right now is really fun. It's right up my alley. It's a book uh, for Wine Institute, they uh, which is the trade association for California's wine industry. They really wanted to promote the um, idea and reality that California wineries are becoming ever more sustainable in their practices, their growing practices and their winemaking practices. And so this is a book about uh, California's sustainable table, not just wineries, but the crops that California grows, the the main specialty crops like almonds, uh, figs, dates, uh, plums. Um, And I'm interviewing farms, farmers and watching them. Uh, harvest and process their crops and talking to them about how they are doing it more sustainably than they were a generation ago. And same with, with wineries. Um, I'm, uh, we're featuring a different winery for every one of California's growing regions. And I get to dive into sustainability issues with them, how they're conserving water and energy and resources and being you know, more thoughtful members of their community, all the things that go into being having a sustainable mindset. Wow. I love it. Well, Janet, <laughs> you are very busy. I'm just like over here. I'm like having a moment of silence for Janet and her big wide world of food and goodness. <laughs> yeah. You said it's not just cheese. I mean, you're writing about farmers markets. You're writing about eating local yogurt. Yeah. Yogurt. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> you make it. Oh my it. God. We are so good at that book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that will be under the Christmas tree. Uh, but <laughs> before we go on, we always ask our guests about their most embarrassing wine story. I think because of, of who you are, I mean, if you have an embarrassing cheese story that you'd like to tell, we could go there too. So it's up to you. If you have a wine or a cheese story that's embarrassing or funny, we would love for you to share that with our listeners. Well, I, I appreciate that you gave me a little heads up on this. So uh, <laughs> I was... <laughs> thinking about about it and actually it just happened to me last week although it happens all the time but it, it, most recently last week uh when I was tasting wines with a winemaker for this book project I am really bad at spitting and <laughs> I, I I'm going to spit if I'm just tasting you know in the mid-morning at 10 in the morning with a winemaker we're tasting six wines I'm gonna spit and and I asked for the spit bucket, and then I can't hit the spit bucket. <laughs> so <laughs> my husband is the most amazing spitter. He can, you know, he can spit wine and hit a bucket, you know, six feet away, and I can't hit the one that's underneath me. So it 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 gets really embarrassing when you you spit and it kind of bounces back up onto your clothes, and, <laughs> and you, you just look like a real amateur. But uh, it's I got to work on my spitting technique. I have to work on that too. It's not my, it's not my talent either. <laughs> no, I, I, I want, I want to practice spitting. Who is it? Uh, the hose master of wine says I can spit like a rabid llama. And that's uh-huh. what I have in my mind. Every time I try to practice my spitting, it's like, I want to spit like a rabid llama. <laughs> <laughs> it takes, it takes some work. It takes practice. It's a lot of practice. It really does. Yeah, it does. So that must be one thing we're not doing often enough. So you know, I can't say that I'm going to incorporate that into any of my daily habits, but 
you know, it does come in handy. But that's a very good story. Do you have a cheese story too that you want to share? You know, I can't, I really can't think of a moment that's been embarrassing about cheese. Cheese people don't do that game that wine people do where they say, guess what this is, or <laughs> guess what vintage this is, or what country Blind it comes from. Blind cheese tasting. I, you know, it's a... Uh, they just don't get into that game. So I haven't had the opportunity to embarrass myself on, on that front. Uh, no, the cheese is, it has never embarrassed me. It's only pleased me and opened my, I'll tell you what it has really done for me. And it just has taken me places I never, never would have gone. Um, not only, you know, literally that I've gotten to go to, visit the small, you know, huts, cheesemakers making cheese and huts in Sardinia and uh, in uh, uh, Corsica and Greece. And, you know, it's taken me to some wonderful places to see cheese making. And it's just introduced me to a lot of different cultures and history and science, which I never would have encountered to understand how cheeses get to taste the way they do. So it's just a fascinating fascinating journey that is a lot more about a lot more than just what the cheese uh, tastes like there are people and places and history and terroir behind it just like with wine there I go again with my moment of silence I think I can't I was just like man I wish Janet was leading us in a cheese tasting right now we might have to have you back on for a, another event where you tell us what to buy ahead of time and Val and I will do our best to um have a little cheese taste along with you because I think our listeners, we've never, just to let you know, Janet, we have never had an episode about cheese. And so I think that our listeners are going to get pretty excited about this one. So, oh, especially Jen when she found that cheese shop in Oregon when we were out there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're going to love this. I, I mean, I'm just like, I'm like, oh, this is reverence. I'm just like, oh, tell me more about the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to have two new converts. And so keep uh, keep on keeping on, keep, you know, challenging your palate and trying some new styles. And because cheese is just as varied uh, and worthy of study as wine, I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, Janet, I'm sure if our listeners do want to get in on the uh, World Cheese Tour, we do have listeners on the West Coast where a lot of your classes are. In fact, you have a, what San Francisco Cheese School? Yeah, I've got a class coming up there in a couple of weeks. I also teach classes at uh, Shed in Healdsburg, a really beautiful store in Healdsburg, California. And anybody who's interested in my, my September class is full, but I have seats in October and they should look take a look uh, on JanetFletcher.com. They can find out more about that class and, and other classes that are on my calendar. That's incredible. And you're also on Twitter. I think we just uh, stalked you on Twitter. And where else can we find you? Well, Facebook, uh, okay. Janet Fletcher on Facebook and Janet Fletcher Food Writer and uh, yeah, Janet Fletcher NV for Napa Valley on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Going That's there right. Now. I just yeah. tagged you on Instagram right before I started uh, podcasting. I was like, oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get Janet in on this. <laughs> there I am. Well, thank you so much, Janet. This was such a pleasure. And I think that we will uh, put our brains together on a future episode and have you back on the show if you will have us. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Janet. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, I just loved her. I I thought she was everything the cheese goddess I thought she would be. She was. She was the cheese. In fact, I was just getting a text from my buddy Dave while we were recording because I can't. I'm recording right now with the cheese goddess, Janet Fletcher. <laughs> <laughs> I like name dropped her when I went into the cheese shop and I felt like so privileged. I was like, I'm recording with Janet Fletcher today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And that was, I mean, the, the fact that, and there was so much more to cover, you know, and I know, you know, we wanted to respect her time, but the fact that there's even a cheese school made me so excited and so giddy and that, that there's this book on yogurt, which I cannot wait to, she autographs all her books too, if you order them from her website. So I'm definitely gonna get my hands on that yogurt book. And, uh, and, and you guys are at home probably going, what the hell? This is a wine podcast. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what? You're talking about yogurt, you weirdos, get back to wine, or I'm turning you off. So Steph, 
let's go back to the fact toy. <laughs> okay. Because I don't think our uh, listeners want to hear about yogurt anymore. So what's going on with the fact toy? Does it have to do with wine? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. And it has to do with the word <laughs> that may come up. Maybe it has. It definitely will at some point. But light struck is a flavor in wine. And you're like, what is she talking about? Light struck? And it's when a wine has been overexposed to light. And that ends up with a result of decrease in fruit aromas and an increase in that yucky, like cooked cabbage, corn, wet dog aromas. And so in the beer world, right, a lot of people are familiar with, oh, this is a skunky beer. Well, so when a wine is skunky, it's called light struck. And this is, you know, why beer and wine are bottled in dark colored glass, because the glass, the colored glass filters out those harmful wavelengths. And in wine, we're really just talking about the white or the rosé wines because they're the most susceptible. And the red wines have a protective veil, basically like tannins and anthocyanins and all of those good things that help protect the wine. And we're not going to get into all of the geekiness, um, but just a few more little bits is what happens is that light, the light that actually can penetrate the bottle and the glass it will excite riboflavin, which is otherwise known as B12, and then it reacts with amino acids, specifically cysteine and methionine, and then a reaction forms hydrogen sulfide and mercaptans, and the mercaptan is the skunky one. And so that's kind of what's going on in the bottle and why that happens and those smells happen and, and things change that wine permanently. But a few more things. I mean, obviously, you can see how we could turn this into an entire episode. But those amber or brown colored bottles, they do filter out about 97 to 98 percent of those harmful wavelengths, as opposed to like the clear or they call sometimes call them flint glass bottles, they only filter out 10%. And so, you know, you can imagine these rosé bottles where you really appreciate the beauty yeah. of that rosé color, but it's in a clear glass, okay? So that's where some of this stuff, you know, you start looking at these bottles differently once you start to realize, okay, they're putting it in clear glass for marketing, not to protect the the wine. And if you do see, let's say like a, a rosé bubbly that's in a dark colored bottle, but they have a bright pink label and a bright pink foil capsule, you know, all that kind of stuff that's packaging because they still want to get the message across that it's a beautiful rosé colored sparkling wine, but they're really working extra hard to make sure it tastes good and smells good when you open it. So, you know, those are a few things to, to notice next time you're uh, buying wine. But even some of the bottles that you see that have the cellophane covering the bottle, there's cellophane wrapping that is specialized to filter out light. So sometimes they want the glass to be clear so you can see the beauty of the bottle once you're presenting it and drinking it, you know, with friends or guests. But the cellophane is now the protection from the light. So just a few more bits. Please, 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 if you would like us to build an entire episode around this topic, you can leave Val and I a speak pipe message and uh, let us know that this is something you particularly are interested in. And we could do that, huh, Val? We could do that or we could do an episode on yogurt. It's up to you. <laughs> yogurt. Any of that would excite my riboflavin. <laughs> I love it. I've got excited riboflavin. That's so funny. Yes, my riboflavin is excited by the yogurt. You've got a wino radar. To, I know I don't have one today because I was busy working on papers all weekend. So, oh. you know, I was just drinking the wine, not really studying the wine. But you've got something really cool on your wino radar. And what is it? Yes. Again, something that was brought to my attention at the Society of Wine Educators Conference. It is Fog Point Vodka from Hangar One Distillery, and this is super cool. You're kind of like going, Steph's always talking about booze. Val's always talking about whiskey. What does this have to do with wine? Well, this particular 
vodka has a lot to do with wine, but it also has to do with sustainability, which is kind of something that, you know, Janet uh, mentioned right at the end of her interview. And I think this is so incredibly geeky and cool. Randall Graham from the biodynamic Bonnie Dune Vineyards, which many people have heard of. He only has like millions of Twitter followers. Uh, That man is amazing. But he makes a vintage white wine that is then distilled specifically for this Fog Point vodka. And you're like, okay, that's cool. But what is Fog Point? Why do they call it Fog Point? Well, this is this is it, guys. This is something I've never heard of before, but there is so much fog in San Francisco that they've tried to figure out how can they capture that. So the fresh water that is blended into this vodka is from San Francisco fog collected on fog catchers, and it literally has its own terroir, as you can imagine and the distiller who's incredibly cool her name is kaylee shoemaker and she actually used to be the distiller uh here in denver for uh stranahan's whiskey oh yeah okay and so she's all about conserving water in california creating something extraordinary and something that you know obviously tastes Uh, exceptional and so you've got to watch the videos they're all in the links it is incredibly moving this vodka is is sold out okay i did get to have a taste of it um at the conference which is another reason why you should go to these conferences remember when you were like hey everybody try this try that oh it's sold out you know that's yeah this is another example But what's kind of cool on the website, they do tell you which restaurants, you know, and on-premise locations, bars and stuff like that, that have the Fog Point vodka. So you can order it, you know, and taste it and stuff. They even have some uh, recipes and things for cocktails. But it's super geeky. (laughs) I want to know what the heck a fog catcher is. Yeah, it's really cool. You'll see it in the videos. It's like it's like a big uh, net. What? And what what they're trying to assimilate is kind of how trees and different plants use fog to, you know, condense it and have it as their water source. And so huh. they've they've had this like biomimicry that they, you know, are using, you know, like this looking to nature to create new ways of capturing water that's out there to be had, right? So pretty ingenious, very cool vodka. So I'd be curious how to separate fog from pollution. Yeah, I don't know. I, did, I didn't see anything on that, although I bet there would be a, quite a bit of commentary out there on it. So, so you guys can see how just anything we talk about on the show can generate more thought and more discussion and more, I mean, and just like going out from wine and cheese. It's it's just a classic thing. If you're going to drink wine, chances are you're going to eat cheese. Or if you're going to eat cheese, chances are you're going to drink wine. And if you're going to study wine, you're probably going to study spirits. And that just kind of is a natural progression for a lot of us in that business. So it's kind of interesting that you brought this up today because it just is. And, and I'm looking at this diagram. Hopefully they'll give us permission to use it if it came from uh, their website. From their but it website. looks like a wine glass, water grapes, wine, hanger. Uh, I know. Th- th- that's so cool. I know. We'll share that with you guys. The videos are amazing too. Like the videos, you're just kind of like sitting there just mind blown on this whole how much these people care about what they're doing. I mean, even Randall Graham, when he talks about how much he cares about the land and his wine and and the vines and mother nature, it's just, right. You know, if you, if you didn't believe you are now a a believer, right? (laughs) that kind of a thing. And we've talked about his 10,000 grape project. I don't know what it is he's not involved in. He's actually one of the original Roan Rangers too, if I'm not mistaken. So it kind of made me think that the white grapes that he's using for this vodka is probably going to be some maybe Southern Roan varieties. I think so. Um, It didn't say. I knew I was like, oh, I'd love to know exactly what is in it so that I can tell everybody on the show, but not out there. Or not that I could find. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yes, you're very welcome. I knew you would like that. And the shout outs, of course, we have to give a shout out to Janet for making the time to be with us today. And she's out there in Napa. And we had a little bit of a 
time snafu, but she was so generous and made it work. So thank you, Janet. Yes, thank you, Janet, for taking time out of your writing, you know, dozens of books and teaching dozens of classes to spend some time with the wine ladies today. We loved having you on the show. And thank you to all our patrons. That's where my shout out's going today, because please know also that if you join the show after the last week in August, that we'll be adding your shout outs at the end of September. And this episode, like we mentioned, is pre-recorded. So as of today, 28 August, shout the hell out to our current patrons. I mean, <laughs> we love you, our tenacious tasters. Jeff E. from We Like Drinking, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, David and Lisa in Illinois, Jen in Maryland, and our it's not five o'clock and we don't care, listeners. Thank you, Meg, Clay, John, Andrew, Aswani, Chantel, Mary Lou, Kathy, Chris and Janet, Steve, Kathy, and Renee, and Diane, who became a patron this weekend. And she's in Colorado, and you'll be hearing more about her as well. And our tastemaker listener in Scotland, David, Carol in Kentucky, and of course, our wine-tastic listener, Laura. And if you would like to be entered into our monthly patron drawing for our surprise wine gift. I think this month it's going to be a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And if you would like early releases of all episodes, exclusive content, shout outs and swag, then you can go to our Patreon page for details, patreon.com, Wine to Five podcast. We are here for you every week, Steph. So you want to go ahead and bring it home? Yes. In between episodes, you can find us on the social spaces at wine, T-W-O-F-I-V-E. And we encourage you to join our private Facebook group called one, two, five, community. You can connect with Val on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed and as Vino with Val on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. You can connect with me on Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram as the Wine Heroine. And so we will chat with you next week, everybody. Cheers, Val. Cheers, Steph. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5 and tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips. Tip, 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 t